So Aaron and I are working on fitting this next cedar here on the port side. And we got it clamped on the boat. And as you can see, we got a pretty good gap up here in the stem. And we have the same kind of gap in the stern. And what we're gonna do is pull a bunch of measurements, which Aaron's working on doing right now. And what we're trying to do is mark where we're tight and where we're open. So, you know, here we're a bit open. Back here we're touching, it seems like. So we gotta mark just where we're touching, shave that off a little bit, and get the cedar to set down. And we need to be a little more particular with the cedar than we have been with the oak. I'm gonna talk about why that is here in a second. Um, but the goal is to have just a little bit of an open seam out here to put caulking in, and to have it light tight slammed shut on the inside edge. So Aaron's just checking the gaps on the outside, on the inside, seeing if we need to tweak the bevel at all and marking all the high spots for us to take it down. Two. What are you saying about reading about the old timers planking boats? That if you didn't get it on your third fit, you wouldn't have a job next week? I think that is right. Alright, so this is fit two. Right. Uh. <coughs> so I mentioned that we need to be more meticulous with fitting the cedar planks than we necessarily did fitting the oak planks. And I want to talk a little bit behind my reasoning for that. Uh, a big part of that reasoning is that oak moves dramatically more than cedar. So if we look here, oak radially across the grain is going to swell roughly 5.6%. Tangentially, it's gonna go roughly 10.5%. And this is from green timber to oven dry. Now ours is not oven dry, but it is definitely not green. It's somewhere in the middle of that. And when the boat goes in the water and all of the timber takes up, it's going to gain more moisture than it would if it were green. So if we had planked the boat in perfectly green oak and put it in the water, those planks would still swell because they are going to get wetter than the green timber would be. Now if you compare the oak to cedar, we're looking at 2.2 to 2.9 percent radially versus 4.9 to 5.4% tangentially. So the cedar literally moves about half as much as the oak does. It's a much more stable timber. Uh, so what does this radial and tangential mean? That is talking about the grain direction. So if we look at this board here, this is a piece of flat sawn ash, and you can see the growth rings go this way. So tangentially is along your growth rings, radially is across your growth rings. So this board, if it were oak, would move roughly 10.5% this way, and it would move roughly 5.6% this way. So you're taking the widest part of the board and it's moving the most, which is why flat sawn lumber is generally considered less stable than quarter sawn. It's just because it moves more. So if we were to compare that to say this piece of oak that's beautifully, perfectly quarter sawn, these growth rings go right across the board and tangentially where it's gonna move the most is a narrow part of the board. So if this swells 10.5%, it's really not moving all that far. But if we moved 10.5% radially, because that's such a bigger board, that's a much bigger percentage. It's gonna move a lot more. And the other thing is that the oak is below the water line. So the plan for Arabella is to live on her and cruise her. I don't think she's gonna get hauled out for six months a year like a lot of boats do. So that oak down below the water line is gonna get wet, it's gonna stay wet, and it's gonna swell right up. Um, where the cedar, it's gonna be above the water line a lot of it. So it's gonna go through more wet and dry cycles, which is why one, having the more stable timber up there makes sense. Um, but two, it's just not gonna swell as much because the top sides are never gonna get the thorough soaking that the oak below the waterline will. The other thing to consider in this equation is the crushability of the timber. 
So if we were to take this oak and we were to hit it with a hammer, you would see that it doesn't dent very easily. It doesn't like to crush, it's very hard. If you take cedar, it's super soft and it crushes a lot easier. So if we were to take really dry oak and plank the boat super tight, all of that oak would swell and the oak wouldn't really compress. It wouldn't have anywhere to go. So we would start stressing fasteners, we could start cracking and breaking frames, uh, and we could have some big issues with that. So if we look up forward here in the hull, not including the keel timber, which will swell with everything else, we're looking at just over three feet worth of oak. So say that three feet of oak move 2%, which it is absolutely going to do. We get about 0.72 inches. 4% uh, would be almost an inch and a half. 6% would be just over two inches. 8% would be almost three. And 10%, which is the maximum the oak really should move, would be 3.6 inches. So if you were to go through and add up the little gaps that we have between all these seams as it sits now, I guarantee you that that's less than what's gonna close up if it swells the 4%. There's not 1.44 inches worth of gaps between these oaks. Uh, so as this all swells and takes up, this should all slam totally shut. And like I said, if we were to plank this really tight with really dry oak, we could run into problems where it would swell that six, eight or 10% and it would have nowhere to go and it could really start to cause some issues. Uh, but like I said, the cedar is going to be mostly above the waterline and it does not move nearly as much and it crushes much easier. Uh, so we want to make sure that we get all of those cedars a lot nice and tighter, um, which is easier to do too because the cedar is just that much easier to work with and handle than the oak. So kind of nice to have the oak down low where it's going to get wet, stay wet, and we didn't have to be quite as meticulous fitting it. Uh, but now that we're getting to the cedar, we got to step up the planking game a little bit to make sure that it has enough, uh, that the gaps are tight enough that the cedar even just swelling a little bit will close that up. One question we've been getting a bunch lately is why we're planking Arabella from the garboard to the shear and not the shear to the garboard or any other combination thereof. So if you talk to different boat builders, a lot of them have different preferences on how to go about doing this. And it also depends a bit on the construction style of the boat. Um, but just about any boat, whether it's bent frames or sawn frames, you can start at the shear and you can start at the garboard and you could start in the middle if you want. And there's some pros and cons to all of that. And partly that depends on your style of construction. We believe for us, it makes sense to go from the garboard up to the shear and just put the first plank on and march our way up the boat. And by doing that, we eliminate what's called a shutter plank. So if you were to say, start at the shear and work your way down a bit and then stop and go down to the garboard and fill back up to that line, you would end up with a gap down the middle of the boat where you would have to fit the plank perfectly to the one above it and to the one below it. And that's called a shutter plank. Uh, so if we go from the garboard up, we don't have to fit a shutter plank. And if we were just to march from the shear down, our garboard plank at the bottom would more or less end up being a style of shutter plank. One of the other big differences is the style of construction. So we have Arabella's built with bent frames and the bent frames, they have a bit of play to them. It can go in, it can go out, it can go right, it can go left. I can shove it down, I can pull it up. And we have a bunch of flexibility here. So by going from the garboard up to the shear, we can take advantage of this flexibility as we go. And if we didn't get things totally steamed perfectly right, we can pull this forward a little bit, shove it aft some, put some weight on top of it, shove it down, unclamp it, let it spring up a little bit. And we can really, really use that to our advantage. As one boat builder we've talked to said, uh, bent frame boats kind of have more in common with basket weaving than they do any other type of construction. And after getting this far, I kind of tend to agree. Um, but that flexibility is really advantageous. And by the time all the planks go on and the bilge bands go in, all of that flexibility will be gone uh, and everything will be locked in and be really solid. And if we go back a little bit farther and we go look at the sawn frames, you will see that those do not have the same give and play to them. And as you can see, these don't move. 
I end up just kind of shaking the whole boat. But they do have a lot more meat. They're much bigger. Um, so shaving off a sixteenth, an eighth, even a quarter of an inch from these is not going to drastically affect their strength. If we were to shave that off the bent frames, that starts to be a little bit of a different story. They do not have the same meat and mass that the sawn frames do. So no matter what you do, it's a bit of a toss up. It's a bit of a compromise. Uh, there doesn't really seem to be anything in boats and boat building that isn't in some way, shape or form a compromise. Um, but I hope that answers some of your questions as to why we are planking from the guardbird to the shear and not from the shear to the guardbird or some other combination and why Leo with his on frame boat is jumping on to shear clamp and deck beams while we're doing planking. Um, and I could lie to you and just tell you that we and Leo talked about it and decided to do different things to keep you all a little more entertained. But it just so happened that uh, we're building different boats and they have different styles and different ways of doing it. And uh, so lucky for you folks, if you follow us both, you get to see many ways to skin the same cat. Um, so. And that's just an expression here. Many ways to skin a cat. We're not actually literally skinning any cats. <laughs> so yesterday Aaron and I worked on this plank here and we got the middle to fit and then we each worked on this. He worked on the stem and I worked on the stern. Chopped a little more on the rabbit there and got this one pretty much ready to go. So this top edge is going to be the mating surface to the plank below it and this bottom edge will be the top edge. So we're gonna fair this out today and make sure that's really smooth, take out any dings that we put in it when we we're fitting it. And we should have this one fastened up on the hull today. At least that's the plan. We'll see what happens. Yeah. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> you ready to do some chopping on the rabbit? Uh, yep. All right, cool. Well, let's get to it. Akiva's out here somewhere. He's hunting in the boathouse. How's it going, dog? He's ignoring me. So it is pretty gross rainy day today, but we're working nonetheless. Thankfully, we got a big roof over us. So I'm gonna work on chopping the rabbit here and it's done. So the next plank will end about here. And we're just gonna chop forward a little bit so that I get about that much area. It's kind of smooth and fared into this. And that way, once this plank goes on, we'll have a really nice line that we can kind of work and chop up for the next one and keep working our way up. Um, we've only got, what, three, maybe four more feet of rabbit to cut here in the stern. And there's just so much twist back here and this changes so quickly and I've never cut a rabbit before that we feel for us, it's a bit better to go just a little bit one jump ahead of the plank. Um, definitely probably a little more time consuming than if you were just to cut the whole thing in one shot. But I think the chances of us messing that up since we've never done this before are, are a little too great. Um, so yeah, so I'm just gonna take the chisels and work on extending this up a little bit. So I don't know if you can really see it, but there's a blue line here. And that is our rabbit line. That's a fairly sacred line. We drew that in off the lofted plans. So as I'm extending the rabbit here, I'm chopping in above that blue line and I'm coming in not as far as I think I need to for the bearding line here. And I'm just starting to get a bit of a groove going. And by doing that, I still have room to tweak this down or up uh, depending on how that plank's gonna twist in. So here we have a fid. It's the same thickness as our planking. And we can use this to see how we're sitting. So down here we're doing great. And then we come up here and obviously we're overhanging. And this whole thing needs to come in. Now one of the challenges is that down low, our planking comes in almost at this angle. And as we go up, the planking starts to turn out. So what that does is it makes this bevel go from something like this to slowly something like this. And as we go up the boat, this whole bevel just needs to roll out and change. And it's that change that I'm a little uh, unsure about exactly how much it does it and where it does it. And you figure that out by following battens around the molds and putting them in here. Um, but we've still found it, especially for our first time doing it, to be a little bit tricky. 
But this is one of those instances I'm trying very hard to sneak up on things. I don't want to cut right to the line the first time. Um, because if we get that angle a little bit wrong, we're in big trouble. There's not really going to be enough room to, uh, to adjust it and tweak it depending on which way it goes. So I got a few of these thinner oak fids that we can use for fitting. Put it against the frame like that and see how we're sitting in the rabbit. And then I also have a much bigger cedar fid. And I can't put this in the way, in here right now because you all and the GoPro are in the way. Um, but if I move you, this can sit against the plank below it. It'll give me an idea where that one's gonna sit. And then I can take the fid and put it above that and start running that in. And I'm gonna need a little bit longer fit here so that I can still land on the frame back here. Uh, and we'll just slowly keep working it up. But I found these fids to make a really big difference in being able to visualize exactly what's going on in here. Another thing that's pretty handy is to use a chisel that is the same thickness as your planking. So our planking is gonna finish one and a quarter. So the rabbit here needs to be one and a quarter. And this chisel, my great-grandfather's T.H. Weatherby, is actually one and a quarter, which is great. because so I can put it right in here, I can see if I'm 90 degrees, and I can see how deep we are and if I need to go any deeper. Uh, so this has been really, really handy for chopping the rabbit. And obviously, you just depend on what size planking you have, and if you're doing a monster boat, you might have two or two and a half inch thick chisel. So I think this is far enough for now on the stern. Uh, the red paint here marks where the end of the cedar plank we just fit goes. And I've got almost enough for another plank here. And as you can see, if we slide a fit up, that all fits nicely. And up in here, I'm not quite deep enough. So this could get set back a little bit and the angle isn't quite perfect yet. And I'm leaving that alone for now because um, we can get this next plank in and then I'll really have a great base to run the next fit in and let this in a little bit more, tweak this angle just a tiny bit, make sure that fits good. We'll continue it up a little bit farther. And then we'll have a great base after that to kind of start working on the sawn frame and bring in the next one in. And uh, it definitely would be probably faster just to go and run some uh, ribbons and chop the whole thing. But I think I keep saying that the bevel changes really subtly and we're learning how to do this as we go. And so I think going really slow and steady and one jump ahead of the planking here is, is probably our safest bet. Man, it is a windy day out there. The boathouse is starting to kind of rock and roll. I'm glad we've got those beefy trusses and that uh, elevator cable up there. I'd be a little more nervous if it was the old roof in these conditions. Um, so we got, I got the stern rabbit done. Aaron's got the forward rabbit pretty well taken care of. He just did a little more chopping away up there. So I'm gonna go and fair up the top edge of this plank uh, and then we're gonna put it onto the hull. So to do that, I'm using my big rabbit plane here with a fence set to 90. And I'm just working my way down the plank, holding it nice and tight just trying to find any of the high spots. So there's a few spots where, you know, a clamp dinged it a little bit. There's a tiny dent. Uh, we cut it with the skill saw freehand, so that's not totally perfect. So as you can see, really not taking off much. And it's gonna take me a little while to do this. And part of the reason I'm taking such a light cut is that I really wanna make sure we don't get any tear out. If any of this grain tears out, we got a deeper imperfection we gotta get rid of. Um, so having the plane set really, really lightly with a very narrow mouth opening should really eliminate a lot of the tear out. Um, so I think that's worth it. It's just gonna take numerous passes down it to get it all smoothed out. Basically, we're trying to get this top edge as smooth and fair and flawless as possible so that when we cut the bottom edge of the next plank, it'll mate up to it really nice. Um, it's amazing, like we've got a few gaps of light for this next plank when we fit it. 
and what looks like a kind of big gap. Uh, I can't get my stereot rule through there, and the stereot rule is 1 64th of an inch thick. So even just tiny, tiny little dings or gaps or imperfections, I mean a 64th is enough to let the light through, and we really want to start getting these planks light tight on the inside since we're getting above the water line and they're just not going to get and stay as wet and the cedar doesn't swell as much as the oak. So it's more important that we get these really, really tight. Um, so getting this top edge perfect and getting rid of any imperfections down to a 32nd or a 64th of an inch is going to make a big difference. Yesterday went pretty well, and then it went pretty poorly. Um, Aaron and I were working on the plank here. We got the top edge smoothed off, and then we got it clamped onto the hull. Got everything dolphinited. It all looked great. We started to fasten it off. We started at the stem and went towards the stern. And we got to this point here where the sawn frame is, and I went to drill this hole for a screw, and the counterbore just got a little bit into the surface of the wood here and the thing snapped. It just went off like a gunshot. So you can see that just broke right across the grain there, split the whole face of the board out. And I believe the reason for that is because Arabella is a double ender and we were trying to take the cedar and make it twist as it goes into the stern. And everything that I've heard and read about the cedar is that it just does not like to twist. And that definitely seems to be the case here. Um, so, unfortunately, the rest of this plank, well, fortunately, the rest of the plank fit well and behaved well, and it's already fastened off. Um, so far, the cedar has actually been quite trying. I, uh, I think I find oak planking easier, and I never in a million years would have thought that I would say that. <laughs> 